Was there a moment, a person, or a, a book, or some kind of media that like grabbed you that you can remember? What was the first thing that grabbed you that made you say to yourself, I want to do art, I want to do this? So when I was really, really, really little, like, I don't know, I can't re remember even being able to talk. I remember finding like my mom's, like she had drawn a book in high school about a flea. And like, I thought it was so cool that like a normal person could do their, like could just make a book. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, both of my parents are super, super artsy. Mm. And so like, just like, I just grew up thinking that that was like, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. um, but then I remember like maybe being eight and, f and going, like we were allowed to go to like the white hen pantry and we could each get like one thing. And my brother would always get like a chocolate bar. Mm -hmm. And I discovered like Cracked Magazine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it blew my mind. <laughs> it totally blew my mind. And there was also one that was like similar that was like totally not appropriate for like a, a, a nine-year-old girl or eight-year-old girl, which was like cartoons, which is like, it was like Mad Magazine, but about cars. Do you remember that? I just saw it at the swap meet. And Are you I didn't serious? Pick it up. Yes, they have. Them. I think there's a guy that had them for like five bucks. I'm a, and I was this close to buying. I'm imagining they would not age well. There, it was a lot of like big-breasted women, mm -hmm. cars with like huge back tire. Mm -hmm. I mean, like not that that doesn't age well, but like it was mm -hmm. just it was very just kind of like broy, I mm -hmm. guess. Um, but like, it was the same. I don't know if it was the same artist that yeah. did Mad Magazine and Cracked, yeah. but it was similar. Yeah. And that was, <laughs> was one of like, I was just obsessed with any time I would go to White Hen Pantry, I had to find like one of those magazines. That's funny. And yeah, that was kind of like, I, I feel like even though I went on to, you know, like we did classical art education in university, I feel like I cannot shake the like comic book format. What are some of those comics that you just love? Like you're never gonna get rid of. Yeah, I mean, comics are, are like, honestly, it feels like your mom's home cooking to me. Like I have always just loved any comic I could get my hand on. Obviously I've kind of like, matured matured and I don't feel, you know but still like anytime even I see like an Archie comic or be I remember my friend's dad when I went to go stay I went to England for the first time I stayed at a friend's house and I was talking about how much I love comics and he bought me like a Beano annual mm -hmm. and like those Dennis the their version of Dennis the Menace who's really a menace not right. not a cute menace yeah I really, really feel very like nostalgic about Bino, and like my all-time favorite is like anything the Hernandez brothers do, the Eleven Rockets, and you know the all anything that they've done. I mean, that's like amazing, incredible artwork and storytelling. That's just kind of yeah. Those are like British comics and Eleven Rockets. Those are my favorites. Oh, I mean. Calvin and Hobbes, the things that are just kind of like classics, yeah. I guess. Yeah. I would never, I would never get rid of any of my comics. Yeah. Were you a fan of like Crumb or the kind of that? Kind Not of when I was younger. I think I've I've found Crumb more like in college, yeah. um, and I I love Crumb's artwork. Obviously, there it's some of it can be kind of problematic, sure. but that kind of like artwork which is also similar to the, like the American Splendor type mm -hmm. artwork I, yeah. I love that stuff yeah were you always into the it's were you ever into kind of more of the mainstream stuff did you read you know, there was one Justice point League that League I really League. liked um, X-Men comics um, so growing up in Athens um, we had like our own version of these kind of like their mainstream comics, which is like Blick and I don't know, they're very, very adult. Mm -hmm. um, 
and also we had access to more like Italian things and Dylan Dog, which is freaking amazing. I don't know if I've ever let you, oh, my Dylan. Yeah. Dude, oh, okay. so good. Okay, I'll check it out. And like Asterix and Tintin, French, okay. like Hergé yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I I found um, like the X Men world, mm -hmm. and really got into collecting anything that was in the X Men world. And I found like, you know, that the connection between like something that's happening in Cable is also like. Mm -hmm referencing something that's happening in a Wolverine comic. Like, I really yeah. loved that yeah. until the X-Men movies came out. Mm -hmm. And I was so, like, disheartened by, like, in my imagination, how big and amazing these people, like, were. And then to see, like, Halle Berry as Storm, and she's so little and not powerful. I mean, she's an yeah. incredibly powerful actress. I love her. I don't... I just, I just felt like... I don't know when you see something in a book and then you see an actor that you already know who they are play yeah. that that it just kind of like yeah so like at that point my my love for x-men kind of fizzled out mm -hmm. i still enjoy the movies now but mm -hmm. it just i don't know what happened but it just like turned off my my, my ability to read the comics also i really hated cable i thought it was so boring and having one line of all of that be boring, kind of like, it turned me off. Yeah. It turned me off because like I wanted to know the entire world yeah. story, yeah. but then there was like all these like offshoots and the mm -hmm. kids and like, yeah. I don't even remember what they're called anymore, like the mini X <laughs> whatever yeah, they were, the but the new mutants, the new mutants. Yeah, 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 like they were the interesting, crew. Yeah. but it was also like, I was a college student. I couldn't afford all of these comics. Did you, um, in those early years, like your teens and such, were there artists, like fine artists or other kind of artists other than comics that you kind of were drawn to? Someone's work that you're like, oh, I really, you know, as a, as a young person, really that grabbed me. Or, or that yeah, I was really obsessed with like Egon Schiele and the mm -hmm. way that he drew hands. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, when I was young, I lived in Greece, so we were just kind of like surrounded by very classical things, mm -hmm. which is something that I, I always felt like that there's like a right way of doing things. Mm -hmm. um, it, it took, I mean, this is totally not the answer to your question, but, <laughs> but it, it, it was like a huge revelation when I realized there is no right way it's whatever makes you happy. So like, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm trying to let go of all of those like early, like artists that I was interested in. How old were you when you moved to the States? We moved back and forth all the time. Oh, so like okay. I was born in Minnesota and then when I was like three, we moved to Greece. And then I, I, maybe I was seven, we moved back to America. And then when I was like nine, we moved to Greece. I mean, it was like, Mm. Every two years, we moved back and forth between Chicago and Athens. And then I lived in Athens from when I was 15, like like two weeks short of getting my like learner's permit. I was so mm. broken hearted because in Greece, you, you're much older when you get your driver's mm. license. I didn't even end up getting my driver's license until I was actually 33. Wow. So um, I lived in Greece from 15 until 33, basically. Oh, wow. How is art different in Greece? How are art, how do, how do like, what's the vibe? Is there a difference between the states and Greece as far as like their, their philosophy on art or the way they kind of do things? Or is I it, don't know, man. I feel like, I just, I feel like, so here's the thing. Greece has obviously a, a much more like deep history and like appreciation of the arts and the arts, I feel like they're much more respected. Mm over there and the artists it's weird because there there is a like mentality of greeks that feel like america is so cool and they try to like reference a lot of like sure. the american pop culture and yep. um and even when i was working in advertising there there's this like this feeling like oh america does everything right so actually working 
in Greece, they elevate themselves to a level that because they're aspiring to what they think it is in America. Mm. Whereas America, I feel like they kind of coast in a way mm. that it doesn't feel like they have to like claw at this kind of like this outside yeah. version of like how to be successful. And so like the things that I've seen in Greece, I feel like are I've been much more inspired going to galleries and little art shows and pop-ups there. Are they are they pushing you feel like what I'm getting tell me if I'm right. Are, are the artists in Greece kind of pushing it more? They're hungrier, they're kind of like moving forward. Definitely. Of, of definitely, art? but also there's something about just being in Athens like Pano and I feel it too that like when we're there um we just feel so much more like oh, I have ideas for songs. I have ideas for the. Mm. There's just an energy that's kind of like this ancient creativity that's mm. like soaking up through your feet. It, it it's it has a really amazing. Uh, I mean, there's definitely like a melancholy to it and like a, a difficulty, but it it all leads to something that I think is much more like. I don't know if it's innovative or what, but it has real quality and beauty to it. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, like, I don't mean to talk bad about anything, but when I go to the art fairs here, I feel like I see a lot of the same thing. Like, people thinking, this is what I see other people selling. This is what sells. I'm going to do that. Um, and there's a lot of regurgitation and not enough innovation. And, but there are obviously incredible things happening here as well. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I find that the things that I've seen in Greece, to me, have been more inspiring. But maybe that's just what I'm more open to. Yeah. Uh, tell me about high school. For me, at least, or in the States, I kind of feel like high school is that, that time in your life when you're 13 to 17 or whatever, where you get exposed to a lot of creativity. You know, you start figuring out maybe things that you're really into. And you, that's where, in a way, you create your identity, I feel, is those years. Tell me about you in high school. What were you like? What were you into? We talked a little bit about some of those early comics, but what else were you into? What creatively kind of like got you, got you going? Oh, man. Okay, so in high school, it was tough because we left um, Chicago when I was starting 10th grade. Mm -hmm. So I got to Greece in 10th grade. So you're more like trying to like have a new identity or trying to like, I don't know. It was, high school is so weird, wonderful, horrible. You know, I, don't, mm -hmm. I kind of feel like so separated from who that person is because of a lot, because of a lot of reasons. Yeah. Were um, you like a stoner, uh, no. a goth? Were you like a preppy girl who was no. in sports? Like, like were you one of these artistic, quiet girls in the corner? Like, what were you in? How would you be caught? Or were, are there classifications like that in Greece? So, is that more of an American like concept? These well, what in in Greece? I went to an American high school or oh. American community schools, which is an international high school. Okay, and I was kind of like friends with everybody it was also like i don't know there was like 70 80 kids in my class i don't know i don't remember off the top of my head it wasn't more than 100 people i don't think in my class so like there's there's always like the one goth you know there wasn't like a group of goths or you know there was like <laughs> there's one poor lonely girl who likes joy division <laughs> yeah totally and like uh it was more like I want to say like maybe culturally separated there were like the you know the group of palestinians and the group of like american americans and like i don't i didn't feel like i really really like identified with like one specific group but like it was easy to be like a part of a lot of things you know i was playing i was on the soccer team but i was also doing a lot of art and like i I was into photography. Um, I don't really. When did you decide? Oh, like the the friends that I w hung out with the most okay. were like 
into like California. I had never been to California, but they were like from California. Uh-huh. And they were all into like boys to men and starter jackets oh, okay. and like I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Yeah. That those were my friends. Yeah. So I I, d- I had a starter jacket, but I was like from Chicago. Even though like I I lived in Chicago like I don't know. Yeah. Here and there growing up, so I had like a Black Hawk starter jacket. I don't care about hockey. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> um. But I, I don't I don't know. I was just always I got okay grades without trying. You know, like I got I was kind of like a B plus student that didn't re- I never did my homework. I just kind of liked to socialize and and tell story. I was always like really into storytelling and and theater and just p- being goofy. You know, I just yeah, I've always just been kind of silly. When did you decide, usually it's in high school, but when do you decide, okay, uh, I want to do this for a living? Or I want to kind of. I always knew track. that. Even okay. when I was like a kid, kid. Yeah, like, I'm going to be an artist. Yeah. Did you have a particular, um, like, did you want to be a painter? Did you, like, was there a certain field in art that you were kind of. No, that's the thing is that, like, ever since I was little, like, my parents had this book of emotions and they'd be like, I'm going to do happy, do sad, do this, do that. And so, like, I was really into, I thought I was, I could be an actor, but I don't really like that, that vibe of, like, super, uh, you know, egotistical. I don't know, like, I found, like, the more, I didn't really enjoy being in those, that group of people somehow. Um, I'm also not really great at self-promotion, so that didn't seem, anyways, whatever. I, I, I loved being in in music I remember seeing like Lauren Hill sing for the first time when I was a kid and crying because I wasn't black because I thought that meant I couldn't sing you know what I mean like I just <laughs> I just loved being I loved any part of the arts I just thought like I know when I grow up I'm gonna be an artist so I went and studied fine arts and English literature which were like the two things I loved the most comics Comics, words and pictures. Words and pictures. Right? <laughs> That's what you exactly. <laughs> um, and then um, for my masters, I've also always, always loved the sea. And like, I see the sea. I have to be in it. I love it. It's the best. And so I thought, um, I want to go into marine biology with an art and English degree. And so like, I was applying to like, I'll just apply to Royal Holloway and see if I get into their media arts department and then I can make documentaries underwater. Um, And that's what happened. I got a a media arts degree with a focus on documentary filmmaking. Um, I've never made an underwater film, but that was like what I thought I wanted to do at the time. I mean, I would still freaking love to do that. Were you still drawing at the time you were going to? I've never stopped drawing. I've drawn. I'm still doing some art. But, okay, let me just see if I can tease out a little bit of the reason of you went to college, (laughs) but then why get the advanced degree? Why not then say, hey, I'm skilled enough. I know these things. I'm going to now start putting gallery. I'm going to make a comic, whatever. So I didn't know what to do next. Also, there's not a lot of career options in Greece. Mm. Um, And, like, the salaries are terrible there. And, you know, like, I've always wanted to get away and and go somewhere else and like also my family is very like my dad's family at least is very very like education first above all like we went to a private school we didn't always have private school money like my dad sold his car so I could go on our senior class trip to Florence to see like you know like that was important to him um he made so many sacrifices to make sure we got the best education we could get in Greece. Um, and so like, it wasn't even, there was no question about whether or not I was getting a master's. I graduated, um, I graduated summa cum laude and like, it was was kind of like, yeah, you know, you could get into whatever school you want to, (laughs) not doing science, but, (laughs) but in the arts, um, and so it, there was no question. There was no question about it as long as I stayed in Europe. Um, yeah. What, what about college 
what did you love? What did you learn about college? You know, there's some people who might be watching who, who are thinking about going to art school, right? And there, it's very divisive. Some people say you don't need it. To just go and just just bust your hours because you need to put sure. in the hours. There's those who say it's great for networking, and there's those who say hey, you need these principles of art. You need these elements of design that you need to know, and this is a good way to like learn it formally. What's your take? What did you really get out of that? So. For me, I feel like I've always been moved around a lot and like haven't been able to ever put down roots. And so like I would have never been able to like go out on my own and like just, you know, figure it out. Like I'm not that that's not my character, I guess, you know, um, I mean, you needed the structure. I needed, I I don't think I was ready to do that is what I'm saying. And like, I just have, I I went to college and really enjoyed like the social aspect and making friends. Like those are the people who I'm still closest to today that like I talk to my friends from college almost every day, Mm -hmm. um, 20 years later. Um, And like, it's it's just a good place to discover who you are and what you like. I went to a liberal arts school, so I had to do a little bit of science and history and this, that, and the other. And it really, it feels like that's where you figure out, you know, how to be an adult with other adults um, and learn more about the world, more in depth about the world and economics and I don't think that you have to go to college. It depends on your personality. Um, but for me, it was really, I think also now after the pandemic, people are having a, a hard time with like figuring out how to socialize again. And I think university is a good way to like integrate yourself into actual society and actual like figure out what it's like to be working with people that aren't just high school students, you know? Um, And as for like making sure you have the skills, for me as an artist, drawing is the be all and end all. If you draw every day, you don't have to go learn how to draw. That is not important. What's important is you finding out who you are as an artist Mm -hmm. and however you draw every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, I go through like, like two of these notebooks every month, you know, I go through notebooks constantly, just nothing, nothing is great in them. You know, it's just like discovering stuff, you know, and like who is something that you might want to do, make big, maybe you don't, doesn't matter. But like the point is if you want to be an artist, you make art. Was there a particular teacher or class that really grabbed you like oh man color theory is great or I'm learning how to mix paint or was there some particular technical skill I think that you learned in college that you you value or you you use a lot I really in high school and in college really enjoyed like this has nothing really to do with I guess it does my architectural drawing classes I really really enjoyed them and took away a lot from the people who were teaching them like I really like there to be a specific way to do things so that then you know what the rules are to break I really like knowing also about like I've never been good at math but I really like knowing that like the way that the leaves are growing on my plant is in this Fibonacci sequence it really like simplifies things that like I'm gonna draw it in my style but I know you know, how many branches to put on, how many, you know, like I actually, I appreciate there being rules and being aware of them and knowing like, knowing those things, then you can kind of intuitively afterwards fill your paper or canvas in a way that looks, that looks right, but you might not necessarily know why. It's just been kind of like drilled into you. Yeah, that's a great point. I think it's very critical to know the rules, to know things like that, because then you know not only when to break them, but having an understanding of them allows you to simplify them sometimes and just and make it clear 
Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes people would say, like, oh, you can tell that Andy Warhol or Basquiat or Jackson Pollock, they could never paint because, no, I. I bet William de Kooning, if he wanted to do a life drawing, he could bust one out pretty yeah. easily. Yeah. But he he knows those rules. He knows anatomy. Enough to get bored of them and yeah. to want to, to do your own thing. And I was like, okay, I've done that. Yeah. I've done still lives. Now I'm going to like throw in emotion. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? That's the thing know? too, is that like I notice a lot that like I tend to do a lot of like drawings of people when I'm out on the street and I don't really like these drawings necessarily but i feel like i can like it's just so good. but i'm just saying that like i love to draw with my eyes closed and because i do that then i have like muscle memory to like you know this is drawn with my eyes closed of like a woman and a dragon because i have muscle memory to know like what i mean it looks like crap it looks like it drew with my eyes closed but but you could do it because you're drawing things like real things every day. Like yeah. I don't want to be like a realism artist that yeah. just draws plants and everyday things, but it's so helpful to have those skills like in your back pocket. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Agreed. Um, let's transition a little bit to the film world mm. for a minute. So you graduated, um, Cum laude. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know my Latin. You Doesn't graduated. Matter. Yeah. You're like, okay, now I can make a documentary if I want to, underwater or above water. Where? How did you get into? Tell me about the transition to the film, the film world. I was so lucky. I, I don't even. I, I came. I went to. I had. I had just had my like. My dad bought me this like old school VHS camera. Mm. And camcorder. Can't. Mm -hmm. No, like. Like I can't like the kind that they use like for the like fi do, for a from a TV yeah, like yeah. from a news uh, <laughs> production house. And he bought me one of those, and uh, I was filming something, and somebody in public. It's so embarrassing to have that thing. To not that I think about it. Sorry, this just fell off the table, and um, somebody saw me and was like, "Hey, like somebody I knew." My brother is a uh, is my brother or my cousin. I can't remember how they were related, but he um, he does film commercials, and he uh, is looking for an assistant director. Or maybe he can help you get in the film industry. And I was like, okay, cool, and like met with this guy, and uh, he. I mean, it's a long story, but eventually I became his assistant director. And he is the super difficult person to deal with. Everybody, like, he would go through a different assistant director for, like, years. Like, every time he did a new commercial, he would have to get a new assistant director. And, like, I'm, I just kind of, like, was like a duck. Just everything he would do, I just let it roll off my back. Because I was just, like, learning from him and being on set. And I just found him, like, to be kind of ridiculous like I found it kind of silly uh, that he was so like I don't know eyes rolling in the back of his head because he wanted everything to be perfect he wanted the very last extra at the very back of the club in like a Heineken commercial everyone had to be like a top model and he would drive everybody crazy with these things like he would we would bring in all the extras and every last extra had to be super curated and he'd be like send that person home who the hell? even his mother doesn't think he's cute you know like every and and he was just so kind of like rude and demanding but it also taught me about like quality control and working in advertising first i think is really cuz like advertising is very much about like making everything every last thing had to be perfect and I can't tell me, tell you like how many all nighters we pulled. Like it was, it was, it was great. It was a great education. I don't think I would be up for it now, but in my twenties, like when you have, when you're un, undefeatable, you know, and indefatigable as well, like it was great. Um, so I, I started working as an assistant director with him for years and then got really, um, really disillusioned with how like the the greek system is very like patriarchal and 
people don't want to help each other. Like I would ask editors, oh, can you help me with this and that or whatever? And our jobs don't really overlap and they don't want to help you because, you know, they don't want you to be promoted in any way and they might lose their job. I don't know. It just was not a nice... And I got really upset after working on a commercial where um, we were on an island and they kept making this girl run back and forth across the beach because the producer thought it was like fun to watch her boobs shake up and down while they were doing this and the girl ended up in the hospital with sunstroke oh. and I was like I don't want to I don't want to work in this anymore in this industry I don't want to work with these people um, not everybody thought it was hilarious you know and um, and so I quit and became a scuba diving instructor. I went to uh, Zakynthos and like, there's this cool system where you can like work at a dive shop in exchange for all of your, um, yeah, in exchange for all your training and all of your like, you know, your certificates. And so I, I went through that and then I, went to i mean thank god my dad was so like supportive in helping me with this we didn't we didn't have much but like he helped he helped and sent me to the canary islands to get my um my instructor certificate um and i finally came back as an, an instructor and i got a job on crete and i flew out to crete and i was there for like two days and and broke my kneecap because I didn't tell them that I didn't know how to drive and they gave me the dive van and they're like, oh, your your apartment is in the next town and like gave me the diving van. And I'm, I was like 31 or something, 30 years old and I didn't know how to drive. And I, I mean, so I told one of the others, I'm like, I don't know how to drive, you know, and he's like, don't worry, get in the driver's seat. I'll tell you how to drive. I'll show you. And like, I don't know why I was too embarrassed to tell them, like, I don't know how to drive. I thought that it was like, I was not gonna, I was gonna lose my job as a diving instructor <laughs> if I couldn't pick up other, anyways. And like, I, I crashed the van into like a corner of a house and like slammed my knee into like underneath the steering wheel and broke my kneecap. And uh, that ended my diving career. Cause like, as, a, as an instructor, you've got to be able to like lift the tanks and like, I mean, I love the sea. I always want to be a part of the sea, but like, I guess it wasn't something that was meant to be my career. Do you, tangent, do you go to the beach? You every day. Or... I go every day. Oh, do you go? Okay. I go every single day. Okay. Yes. Because you live by it. So it's I know I live by it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so let's let's geek out on film for a minute. So you know, you're kind of doing film with this guy who's a little like, you know, super, you know, particular, particular and, such, yeah. and you're learning from him. I'm assuming you're learning like technical things, you know, the camera stuff, and as well as like, you know, m management of people and actors, and you know, how do you deal with with all these different characters? Um, what are some of your favorite films? What are some of the films that you've always been kind of... Thinking? Well, The Big Blue, obviously, is my top, okay. top number one film. Okay. <laughs> and The Muppets or... Take Manhattan. Love... I book? freaking love The Muppets okay. so much. Okay. I don't really watch The Muppets very much, but I remember when I was very little, randomly, The Muppets was one of the things that we could get on Greek TV, which was like one channel... And it was like, we'll just show one show for an hour a day, and then the rest of the time is news. And like, we would get the Muppets, and it was just so freaking exciting. The Muppets are fra Fraggle Rock? I don't know. <laughs> Anyways. Um, what are the kind of film? I mean, are you one of these like Criterion film? You know, I mean, I enjoyed I, Or do you like Hollywood stuff? Or do you like the big epics? You know, like. Been her or I really, really or love French. goofy French films, and like one of my favorite films I've ever seen is this Hungarian film called Lisa the Fox Fairy. Okay. Have you seen that? No. It's so freaking good. It's so good. It's and it has like uh, Lisa? It Lisa and the Fox Fairy. Um, it's so good. It's very kind of like it has Amelie vibes, okay. you know, like that kind of really beautiful 
wallpaper might be, yeah. you know, but yeah. like yeah. a Japanese soundtrack on this Hungarian mm -hmm. movie about a mm -hmm. folk tale. So I love magical realism. I love yeah. it. I love it. And, um, and I love fantasy stuff. I don't really like anything that's very, uh, you know, dramas about today like the i don't know succession or whatever all that kind of stuff Shawshank I, redemption i what? liked shawshank redemption it's an incredible movie but godfather that's good too i'm just saying like it seems very like yeah. separated from me i don't yeah. like yeah. things about like oh this family is going through a divorce how will they cope like right. i can't i'm like this is just too stressful you know what i mean right. like yeah, magical realism, gangsters are fine because it's so separated from my reality, you know, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. but when it's like real people and real problems, yeah. I'm like, why do I, yeah. how, how is this escapism? Like, I want yeah. oh, I I want a it. dragon, yeah. I want like some ghosts are great, you know, I, right. some Benicio del Toro, some, you know, okay. some, that okay. kind of, I love that. that kind of stuff. Tell me though about let's just like transition slightly to the strike and what is your kind of thoughts and what what is the current state of the film industry as you see it? Okay, so when I moved here like 14 years ago, I worked as a, a stagehand and like a set painter, um, and eventually joined the Scenics Union mm -hmm. and. What's that called? Is it, is it? I'm in the like I'm actually in the 729, which is okay. set painters and sign writers, and um, and I it is really really hard work. It's really wonderful work, and I feel so lucky to have film like industry like a film industry job, making film industry money and I'm an artist it's like and I get I get to paint every day and it's also taught you taught me like not to be precious about what you paint because they're like paint a mural of like I'm I mean I'm not supposed to be painting murals in the union but when I'm doing non-union jobs I paint murals oh there's a rule against that well the murals are supposed to be like the scenic artists which is like oh. the 829 oh so there is so the, yeah, that's the thing. It's so I'm it drives me nuts. Like, you can't touch that because the, that's the electrician thing. So don't mess with the light flag. Or, you know what we mean? can't like, even. I can't even like touch things. a trowel that's bigger than like two inches because that's the plasterer's job. If it's a job that you need a bigger trowel, anyways. Uh, is, is there is there something like fundamental that can be changed, or is that just the way it is? We've got to be. That Look, special. Atlanta has it right. Atlanta has filmmakers union. We're like they're all in the same union. Which is amazing because for somebody like me, right. who I do, set, I like before I was union, like I do the way I like it. I do one job as a set decorator or um, or art director, and the next job as a scenic or or a set painter mm -hmm. because like one is mentally exhausting, and the other one is physically exhausting, and like to just keep going on for me right. one, I burn out, yeah. and. I had to choose, like, I actually got all of my dates as, like, a, a 44, which is, like, uh, the carpenters and set decorators. So I was going to get in as a set decorator, and I worked to get those days. I, I was working on all these, like, kind of lower-budget movies for sci-fi, like, mm -hmm. zombie-type films. And I hated it. I hated it so much. Um, wow. because, because when you're on a low budget film, you are the art department. They'll like give you some people, but they'll constantly be taking them because they're like, yeah. we need somebody to schlep stuff around. And like, so they just take my stuff yeah. and like my people. And so I ended up being, you know, set painter, art director, set decorator, um, you know, buyer. So I'd have to like, they'd be like, well, this apartment where we've changed everything around and this apartment has to be ready by tomorrow and it's going to be a Japanese girl lives here and she's an architect. So decorate it. And I'm like, by tomorrow and I don't have anything and I've got to like be making, um, you know, fake poop for, I don't know, whatever. You have to be constantly doing stuff. And so like you have to like 
thank God Hollywood is like set up so that there's like a 24 hour Home Depot, there's the, like a million thrift stores, there's like the Bed Bath and Beyond so you can go get some curtains. And I told the production designer like, dude, I don't know what to do. I have the curtains here. I don't have a, a rod to put up the curtains. He's like, just staple them to the wall. It's okay. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm just He's like, just staple to the wall. It's fine. And then like, everybody was so mad that like, they got stapled to the wall and I was like why would you tell me to do something like this what like why could you help me come up with the solution anyways whatever it was really stressful and like it never ends because you know the 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 filming hours might be it might be like 16 hour days it's 12 hours minimum for sure but they're always going into overtime and they're like well you get paid extra who doesn't want double time and so like they don't even ask you if you want to go that is what bothers me is that i've never been you asked you don't have a choice you do not have a choice and i i cannot tell you how many times i've worked weekends against my will like i'm like i've made enough money on this show i don't want to be working this weekend i want to see my family and like but because everybody else is you're working weekends you know you're kind of like abstractly bullied into doing a lot more work than you really necessarily want to and like in the beginning when you're younger whatever it's fine because you're like oh wow I'm making a thousand dollars today instead of whatever um, but you don't see your family you don't see your friends you go home at 7 30 at night and like you like barely have time to take a shower and fall asleep on the couch and then it's 4 30 and you got to go get out and 5 a.m. traffic, which is worse than any other traffic in L.A. because everybody works in the industry and everybody's in a hurry to get to Pomona so or whatever. Six, a. six a.m. everywhere, and then 12-hour days, and and that's like, you know, if you take an hour, a half hour for lunch, that's added on to the end of your 12-hour day. So uh, it's exhausting, and I'm not surprised people are like. I mean, also in my industry, we're working with a lot of toxic things and chemicals, chemicals people. and and people, <laughs> and so you know, people are, you know, they're not, they're dying quite young after they, you know, two years after they retire. It's like, all right, out, you know, and I knew that it wasn't a, a sustainable career. I know I see other people that are older than me much older than me doing it to until re retirement and i just feel like i don't have that kind of, i don't i can't because like in um 2021 i think i had like six days off in total and i was just like so burnt out and then i got my fourth onset concussion on american ninja warrior and any other time that I've been hurt, I've just been like, I got to get back to work. I got to be where I can't deal with all this. Like, you know, it's really hard to deal with the whatever it's called, the disability stuff to try to get like, OK, I'm hurt. I don't I can't go into work. How do I deal with all this? If you have a concussion, it's so hard to figure out. And this time I was I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't not do anything at this point. So like Pano really, Pano, my husband, helped me so much figure out how to like, um, I, you know, actually go on disability long enough to figure out how to take care of myself because like, because of that, I got super, super sensitive eyesight, supersonic, horrible, like sensitive hearing, like, like it it gives me panic attacks hearing like anything and so it's really and also like I at nothing at the drop of the hat in the middle of conversations just start crying like it's made me really weird my memory has gone anyways it messed me up um, and I'm still like I it's been two years and I still haven't had like I haven't been able to figure out like what do I do because I love my job I love it but I don't know how to do it sustainably and I don't know how to be on set anymore because of the noise and light sensitivity so and it fucked up my back anyways so does everybody there because of the intense amount of work the just the just, yeah the intense amount of work because of that 
the demand upon oneself. Does everyone just love freaking movies? Is it that everyone there, or are there people that are just like over or? And I, I'm assuming you go there because you love this. But is there like a feeling of kumbaya? We're freaking making a movie, and this is amazing. And or is that just really you do that the first year, and then you're just like, I'm just going to work. I'm setting up these damn lights. Like, or or is it the spectrum? I it's think the guys it, who still love this and they're freaking whistling. You know what? There's a difference like, between working on TV, which is just like a job. Like nobody. It's like I'm a carpenter. I'm a this, I'm, I'm an electrician, I'm just going in, doing my job, you know, like, yeah. talk to your friends, That's whatever. That's different than a feature when you're going to Fiji for the month. Then you're like, we're making movies. Right, That's right. exciting. <laughs> That's super fun. Every day is different. You're in a new location. You're meeting cool people. Um, you know, like, working on Glass Onion was... I didn't want to do it because that was the year that I was like, I'm so tired. I haven't had a day off in like a year. Um, but I wanted to be in Greece and like, I was like, I'll work with you guys for five weeks in Greece. And then they like begged me to come to Serbia for the next three months with them. And I was like, I'm so tired. I don't want to do it. And then like, I went with them anyways, um, and met the most incredible people I fell in love with Belgrade. I would live there in a minute. It's such a beautiful city, like incredible people. I came back and started to learn Serbian. I just, I, I was really, I think that like working on movies gives you that kind of experience, like life changing, awesome experiences. Like where TV is just like, it's just a job. It's just a job and, and it sucks. Paycheck, but you, it sucks. It sucks. And like, I've never had as much anxiety as like I did with like having to be, I, I don't think there was a day that I woke up not crying that I have to go into work. Like 4.30 is back already. Like it's hard. It's like, you know, when you have to catch an, uh, a, a flight early in the morning and you have to get up at 4.30 and go to the airport or whatever, like, and it sucks, but you're like, okay, whatever. At least I'm going to Fiji. Like, you know, you have to do that every day and you just end up in Burbank. You're not even in Fiji. You know I mean, like, it, why does this keep happening? Is it is it really just the advancement of technology? Is it that what what do you what's your take on this? No, it's like the greed of the people on the top. Like they're making three hundred million a year, and they can't. They're like begrudging the writer who's actually like the reason you're making three hundred million a year. Like, a, a, yeah. you're begrudging them a few hundred dollars extra a week? Are you kidding me? This is nothing to you. This is like when, I, I don't remember, I was, I was working on something huge that was like, uh, it was like a $300 million budget or something. And we were like, oh, could we get like wheelie stools? Because we were painting stuff that's on the ground. And they're like, you don't need wheelie stools. We're like, they're $20. And they're like, yeah, it's $20 for each of you. That's a hundred bucks. We're like, this is like a, a gajillion dollar budget. <laughs> Are you, like, it's so weird where they want to draw the line. And yet, like, I don't know. I think it's gross. It's, it makes me really angry. And I don't really, I don't really want to be a part of making TV in LA anymore. You know, it's it's not like this in the rest of the world. So you've seen firsthand that kind of attitude that you think is kind of exacerbating to the point where the writers are like, okay, we're striking. And yeah, like, I totally don't yeah. blame them. Yeah. And there's also this component too of like new technology, like AI and you know, I, I've it's heard- It's scary. I've heard from two different sources, one in Santa Barbara and one in LA, and they both said, yeah, uh, uh, companies are now using AI to do a first draft. They'll have the AI will do the first draft, and then they'll get some writer to kind of come in. And one of the issues with well, there's a lot of issues. With that. One is that people, young writers, that's like a job that people do. It's like do the first draft. Yeah. So you're taking away that job from somebody, and that's also a learning for somebody. Like. If you don't have people, if you're not doing those first drafts, how are writers growing up? How are we like, you know, getting people more experienced? Well, I don't really know much about like the writing aspect yeah. of the world, but like yeah. now that I've left set painting and I'm going into illustration, 
Yeah. I mean, how are we supposed to com cr compete with what they're creating uh, in in Mid Journey and all these other, you know? Yeah. It's incredible what they're yeah. doing and like the amazing storyboards that they're making and concept art and on and on. It's uh, it it's very scary, but I think that I don't know what the difference is with like writing, but. I know that as an artist, I feel like, yeah, okay, you can get a very incredibly intricate, you know, image from Mid Journey, but you're not going to have the artifact in the end. You don't have, you don't have this, you know, at least at the end of the day, I have, you know, pieces of paper that like I can sell to the next person or they could put it on their wall and they can feel something like this. You can... Yeah can feel that like love and effort went went into that not that one specifically yeah. but <laughs> it, as long as people care about the love and effort but there mean? are well, well, going okay, to so, be so, enough so, people so, one, so i heard this one person say okay ai is here to stay we got to use it as a tool we got to figure it out and people are going to want to go to mcdonald's and get a three dollar burger and that's the three dollar burger at mcdonald's but sometimes you want to go to Eureka Burger and you want to get a $20 burger. That's where you come in. Yeah. Because they're going to pay a premium for the real thing for a real piece of paper. A lot of times though, and companies will companies will use the AI because it's cheap, it's effective, and it's consistent. It'll always come out with what you want. But when Not when, when a person but when a person does a piece of artwork, they'll pay top dollar for that. That is like an element that, you know, with the burger analogy that's like an expensive thing look people were afraid of photoshop you know and sure it changed yeah. it might have some people photography changed magazines in the 7 60s and yeah. 70s there was artists like bernie fuse bob p all these amazing illustrators they started losing jobs because life magazine and saturday new york post saturday post, all that stuff they were going to photography people were freaking pissed about that yeah so it is just another thing, but it is different too. It's an, but it's also like, it's content, you know, it's... It, I mean, the, right, right now it feels it like, just in the past few months, it feels like, first of all, with inflation, everything's gotten so expensive that, yeah. you know, we're, we're kind of like, from one minute to the next, gone from like doing really well to like, uh, should we should we eat out again like twice this week you know like whereas before it was like you could eat out every day no no problem we're in la it's always been expensive but now it's like what the what and we have ai going like that just like a tornado like getting so much better at everything, everything. By exponentially day to day to day to day yeah. where it's like oh man, this is what when i say that i love fantasy movies i will I will walk out of a dystopian like post-apocalyptic movie because I've always felt really gross about them and now I'm like I'm living in those freaking movies that I hated you know like Book no, of Eli type shit you know like yeah yeah no I mean I know we're kind of it's kind of silly it's like ah oh, it's like Terminator but no dude it there comes a time there's a book that I heard about I want to need to get it um this executive at Google who worked on this project called Project X it's like their secret yeah. little project he wrote. The, he, got, he came out with a book called Scary Smart, and he says there will come a time when AI, and we're talking soon, when AI makes the decision that humans are bad for the planet, like to save the planet, you need to get rid of humans. That's the issue, and that time will come when it's like, you know, they can turn off power grid. They can, you know, they will be able to do those things, and when they decide, like, okay. Humans are more bad than they are good, and they need to go. It's not just a James Cameron movie. It's a potentiality, and it's kind of freaky, right? It's horrible. It really is. And, and the horrible thing about it is there's no stopping it. Like, because it's so, it's so right now effective and cheap for companies to use and the way it just like goes that's why control. we've got to like move to places yeah. where they don't re like i was in uh costa rica or like zanzibar i was in zanzibar like they don't have they don't like 
I remember talking about like World War II or something, and they were like, who's who's Hitler? What do you mean? (laughs) Honest to God, somebody asked me who Hitler was. Like, also, like, asked me, what is a ghost? Like, they're just so innocent and like, what, let's just move there yeah. and be like, yeah. you guys go ahead and destroy yourselves. They are already yeah. figuring out how to like live yeah. without, you know, yeah. the things that we think we need. Like, oh, I can't live without Amazon or the internet. Yeah. Like people freak out if they, the Wi-Fi falls. I'm like, that's yeah. a good day for me when like, I don't have to be <laughs> distracted. No, that's a good point. Let's go back to comics a little bit. And yes, please. <laughs> Let's go back to the intersection of comics and film because some of my favorite films yeah. are clearly inspired by comics. Yeah. Blade Runner. Oh, all, the, all the Ridley Scott stuff. Yeah. You know, Blade Runner, Alien, uh, the thing, Car- Carpenter stuff is comics. Steven Spielberg loved comics back in the day. All these film directors and yeah. creators are huge fans of Mobius. Of huge yes. fans of all the all the European art of the heavy metal magazines, uh, all that stuff. It's always been this bed of like cool ideas, like the Jodorowsky Dune the thing. Jodorowsky, yeah, yeah, that is that. I really want that book. I want them to make that book. I'll yes. pay hundred bucks for that big ass yep. book of the look book or whatever you call it. From your wildest to God's um, ears. <laughs> so, so yeah, so so that's what's kind of cool is that. Art, you know, film has used uh, comics as a way to like get ideas. I do think that it's a little different now over the last twenty years. Now it's more like we're going to strip mine these books for shows and for movies. Meaning, you know, um, publishers are now like, yeah, we'll publish your book, but that's just a way to like make it in a movie. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, does this have appeal? Does this comic have an appeal to like to turn into a CW show? Then, then we'll print it. If it's not, then we won't. And that bothers me because you are kind of like now saying, okay, a comic has to be made. It has to be a certain type to be made into a movie potentially. But my favorite comics are things that could never be made into a movie because. <laughs> Of the language and medium that a comic is, yeah. that a movie can't, yeah. that it can't do right, uh, and they've tried to do it with like Watchmen. There's some things that they've like tried to yeah, do yeah, some yeah. attempts. Um, but I don't. Do you know Chris Ware? Mm-hmm. Of course. You cannot make a movie into that mm-hmm. stuff. It, it's impossible. Mm-hmm. That inspires me because it shows this is a different medium. When you translate it, it loses all freaking meaning. Well, for me, I have always felt that like you should for me again like making something because you want to make it into you're hoping to make it into something to make money blah 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 it does it's kind of like well okay whatever but like i really i really love art that is being made because you just want to make it you know like you're just making your comic because like that's the way that you communicate that's the way that you you know see the world then that's that I think is the most precious thing to me yeah Yeah, no I agree wholeheartedly Um, like I I don't think you can make a movie out of (laughs) panoisms no uh, you probably couldn't but you could write a treatment of like this guy who's married to a girl and they're there sure yeah yeah, yeah. inspired by you know like American Splendor Ghost World there are there are these movies made from like indie books. Have they made a, a Love and Rockets into a movie? I'm sure it's been in development for like many times. Yeah, but yeah they have it, and maybe that could be because, because the, the magic is in the drawing. Let's say our time is up. We're gonna get kind of heavy, slightly, if you're up for it. Our time is up, and uh, we. What is the message you want to give to the world, to your family? As you are leaving, what did what did you learn here? What do you think is the most important thing about life, humanity? Definitely, I've definitely seen that trying to push yourself to do something that you don't want to do for reasons that, like you think that you really 
want money or success like all those things are it's not they're not real like right now if you can find what will make you happy this very moment like for me this very moment i'm happy hanging out with you and having like a connection with you and doodling while i'm talking to you those are things that make me really happy and i think that we're put here to find like how to like how to make our, ourselves feel good like when you're feeling if you really make me angry it's actually to teach me how to have unconditional love for you because that will make me feel good even if you're being a little shit you know and and I really think that that's what we're we're put here for is just to find a way to like bring more joy to ourselves because that's going to that's going to exponentially grow like if I can inseminate that in you and you go home you inseminate that into your son and he grows up with trying to find joy in the world like that's what's gonna that's what's gonna elevate the vibration of the world i think yeah that's good well said yeah thank you very much anna appreciate your time thank you You're welcome.